Yes, and so then at the, near the end, I want to try to uh, propose a way to interpret it using uh, a version of partially wrapped uh, floor homology that uh, seems to make, make the picture a lot clearer. Uh, okay, so uh, this is joint work with Tobias Ekholm and Vivek Shende. So the, the setup is as follows. So I'm gonna start with a knot inside of R3, just a smooth knot, uh, and then we'll, we'll push this into the symplectic or context world. So uh, uh, we can look at the cotangent bundle of R3. Maybe I'll just take the disk, disk bundle associated to it, so just the disk part of this. Um, so this, as we all know, is a, this is a symplectic manifold. Uh, so there's a standard uh, symplectic form on it. Okay, and its boundary is uh, the unit cotangent bundle, so the cosphere bundle of, of R3, and this is a contact manifold. Uh, and the contact one form is just the sum of PI dQi. So here the, the QIs are the position uh, coordinates and the PIs are the dual momentum coordinates. Um, okay. So th that doesn't use the knot so far. So uh, the knot also gives us something nice in here, and this is the Lagrangian co-normal. So this sits inside of, uh, well, this is going to sit inside of the cotangent bundle, so it's going to be the set of uh, Q and P such that Q is in K, and P annihilates the entire tangent space to K at Q. This sits inside of say the disk cotangent bundle to R3, and this is a Lagrangian submanifold. So this, uh, this is the co-normal bundle. This is Lagrangian. Okay, uh, and inside of the, this contact manifold, the contact boundary, we can look at the intersection of this with the contact boundary, so this is, the intersection of this Lagrangian with the contact boundary, and this is Legendrian. Uh, so uh, the contact one form, if you pull it back to this, uh, is identically zero. Okay, so the picture is, so I'll just use up this board as a schematic picture. So here's R3, here's the disk cotangent bundle to R3. Uh, and its boundary, I don't know how to draw this, its boundary is the cosphere bundle. Uh, and inside of R3, there's a knot K. And the co-normal bundle is a Lagrangian that intersects the zero section along K, so this is LK. And where it hits the boundary, this is the Legendrian lambda K. Okay, so um, topologically, the, this uh, co-normal bundle, well, it's, it's uh, diffeomorphic to the normal bundle to K inside of R3, so the normal bundle uh, looks like a tubular neighborhood. So this is, this is, topologically, it's a tubular neighborhood of K in, inside of R3. Um, and so it's topologically a solid torus. Uh, and then its boundary is topologically a two torus. Uh, and this sits inside of uh, the unit cotangent bundle of R3, which again, if you don't care about the context structure, this looks like just R3 crosses S2. Okay. Um, so th this is the main thing that I'm going to be interested in. I'll, I'll call this maybe the co-normal torus, and so this is a Legendrian uh, two torus sitting inside of a contact five manifold. Um, and uh, if you forget about the contact structure, then, then this is just a topological two torus sitting inside of this five manifold, and it turns out that uh, for any two knots inside of R3, their, their tori are smoothly isotopic. So for any knots, 
k and k prime inside of R3, uh, lambda k and lambda k prime sitting inside of uh, R3 cross S2 are smoothly isotopic. So this is an easy uh, topological exercise. It's essentially just that uh, the, the co-dimension is high enough. So these are co-dimension three submanifolds inside of R3 cross S2, and it's easy to check that they're homotopic, and so you can just uh, perturb the homotopy a bit so that it becomes an isotopy. Um, uh, but we can say more. So uh, if K and K prime are actually smoothly isotopic, so they're actually the same knot, uh, then their conormal tori are not just smoothly isotopic, but actually isotopic through Legendrian submanifolds. So then. So isotopic through Legendrian submanifolds, uh, the sh shorthand for that is Legendrian isotopic. Uh, maybe I should say that, so isotopic. Of, th of this uh, contact five manifold. So the question then is, uh, how much does the contact topology of this contact five manifold along with this Legendrian torus remember about the smooth topology of the underlying knot? Um, uh, and the answer is it remembers everything you, you might hope for. So here's uh, the results. Uh, so this is from earlier this year. Uh, so it was first proven by Vivek and then uh, reproven in the work that I actually want to talk about uh, Okay, and the result is that the converse of this observation is true. Um, so if k and k prime are, are smooth knots and lambda k and lambda k prime are Legendrian isotopic, uh, then k and k prime are actually s the same knot. Um, Okay, so that, that, by that equals, I guess I mean that they're, they're smoothly isotopic. Um, okay, so uh, maybe a short way of saying this is that this Legendrian co-normal is a complete knot invariant. So it can completely detect uh, when two knots are different uh, by telling you whether the co-normal tori are Legendrian isotopic or not. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a pretty strong result. I, I want to say, I want to spend most of uh, today talking about uh, an approach to the proof of this. Uh, so maybe first I'll talk about uh, Vivek's original approach, but it is sort of mysterious to me and I don't understand it so well, so I'm going to just uh, say it extremely vaguely. So. Uh, so the idea is to somehow from this Legendrian uh, conormal, this conormal torus lambda k, uh, extract some topological information about the knot itself. Um, so uh, and his, his approach uses uh, sheaves. So you take a, the derived category of constructible sheaves uh, on R3 with singular support in this uh, Legendrian co-normal and somehow from this extract uh, the group ring of the knot group. So pi k is pi one of 
R3 minus K. It's the fundamental group with the knot complement, so this is the knot group. Okay. Um, okay, so once you do this, you're in pretty good shape because the, there is a result that the knot group more or less determines the knot. Uh, to be slightly more precise, you have to use the following facts. Uh, so fact one is that knot groups are what's called left orderable. This has been known for a long time. So left orderable means that there's a total ordering of the group uh, that is invariant under left multiplication. Um, okay, and then fact two is if you have a left orderable group, then the, the uh, group ring of the group determines the group itself. So if G and G prime are left orderable and their group rings are isomorphic, then the underlying groups are isomorphic. Okay, this is actually, this is some fairly easy algebraic fact, so uh, you can just check this. Um, so, what you get out of this is if, if uh, lambda k and lambda k prime are Legendre and isotopic, maybe I'll write it like this, then this implies that the knot group of k is isomorphic to the knot group of k prime. Uh, I'm using the same notation for lots of things, so Legendre and isotopic. So, uh, yes, question. Uh, so the question is, does this result also fail for links? Uh, I actually don't know offhand. Uh, I think we just don't know. Do we think about links in particular? Um, I think it's probably still, wait, sorry, which, which result fails for links? Oh, th that the, yeah, that the pi one of the, not co the link complement determines it. Um, that's right, so, so in fact, this is also not enough even in the not case because you need to identify the longitude and meridian. Um, so I think in the link case for this result, we can still identify the longitude. The peripheral subgroup is enough, is it not? Even for links? Um, Okay, actually, I don't know offhand, but that's, I think, I think that this, our result, I, if I had to guess, I would guess it still works for links, but I, I don't know offhand. Okay, so, um, so a little bit of further work uh, considering a holonomy uh, and local systems uh, tells us, it, or in Vivek's argument, this this says that uh, the isomorphism that sends pi k to pi k prime actually also sends uh, what's called the peripheral subgroup of pi k to the peripheral subgroup of pi k prime. Um, so the isomorphism uh, sends longitude to longitude and meridian to meridian. So each each knot there's a there's a distinguished there are two distinguished classes in in pi one of the knot complement which are the longitude and the meridian classes, and you can just check that uh, if you if you work a bit harder you can you can check that this isomorphism actually preserves those and then it's an it's a classical result of uh, Waldhausen I think from the 60s uh, that then that says that k and k prime are the same. Okay. Um, so, so that's a very brief sketch of, of Vivek's argument. Uh, it's 
very elegant. The paper is quite short. I don't really understand it. So what I, what I want to do is I want to present a, a, an alternative approach uh, that will end up in the same place but uses uh, uh, holomorphic curves and Legendrian contact homology. All right. Let's see. Um, so, to set up Legendrian contact homology, I'm just going to sort of uh, give this as brief a treatment as I can. Um, this is rationalizing to Eliasberg and Hofer. Uh, so, the, the setup is a little bit more general than what I'm actually going to apply it to. Uh, so let's suppose that lambda is a Legendrian submanifold inside of a contact manifold V. And just to make life easy, I'm going to assume that the contact manifold has no closed rib orbits. So for simplicity, this is all we'll actually need. Uh, one jet space is our contact manifolds. Uh, and the, this contact manifold, the cosphere bundle of R3 is the one jet space of S2. So that falls into this category. Um, and out of this, uh, we can construct uh, what's usually called the chekhanov eliasberg uh, differential graded algebra. Um, so it is AD. Um, a is the, so the algebra is the easier thing to say. So it's the algebra over Z uh, generated by uh, two things. So one of them is rape chords of lambda. So this is, so if, if lambda looks like this, a rape chord is just an integral flow of the rape vector field that begins and ends on the, uh, on lambda. And so let's, let's suppose that, just for simplicity, let's suppose that they're finitely many. And I'll write them as A1 through AN. So this is maybe AI looks like this. It's all inside of B. Um, and the other thing that we need to put in is elements of the first homology of lambda thought of as a multiplicative group, or you could uh, talk about the group ring of H1 of lambda, something like that. Um, okay, that, that part, it's sort of important to our argument, but not maybe so important to the exposition, so I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that now, but then I'll probably drop it. Um, so, a generator of this algebra, so, so it's multiplicatively generated by these things. So a generator of the algebra as a Z module maybe looks like, um, an alternating product of rabe chords and elements of H1 of lambda. So it might look like alpha zero A I1, alpha 1, AI2, AIK, alpha K, where the alpha Js are in H1 of lambda, and the AIJs are rape chords. Okay. Um, and again, I think of these multiplicatively. So, like, one of these could be one 
uh, the, the alpha i's could be one that would correspond to the zero element in H1. Um, okay, so that's, that's what the algebra is. The grading maybe I don't want to talk about, but it's uh, these, these things which I call homology coefficients, those are in grading zero, and the Rabe chords are graded by uh, their Conley Zander indices. Okay. Um, And the differential, so this is the interesting thing. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll define the differential of alpha to be zero if alpha is in H1. Uh, and then I'm going to define the differential of a Rabe chord, AI. Um, And this will be some sort of Fleur theoretic sum. So this is going to be a sum over uh, certain rigid moduli spaces. Uh, and the dimension is actually not zero, but one, because there's an R action floating around. Uh, and over each such thing, I look at uh, elements of this moduli space quotiented out by this R action. Uh, there's some sign involved that I don't want to talk about, and then there will be a word associated to uh, to delta. So let me uh, maybe explain what this moduli space is by a drawing, and then that will also explain what this what the word is associated to uh, one of these points in the moduli space. Uh, okay. So a moduli space like this, so all of these things that I've written here, these are, these are Rabe chords. Um, and it's supposed to be the set of uh, holomorphic disks of a certain sort. So let me draw it. Uh, make this a little bit bigger. So this is supposed to be R here. And what I've just written, drawn here is R cross V. So V is in this direction. Um, and now inside of R cross V, there is a Lagrangian cylinder, which I'll attempt to draw in color. Uh, this is R cross, uh, that was sort of too far in the corner. This is R cross lambda. So it's going to, it's, it'll be maps from a disk, oh, sorry. So this is a disk, a two disk, uh, with a number of boundary punctures. And the disk with its boundary will map to this, uh, R cross V is called the symplectization of V, and the boundary of the disk will map to this Lagrangian cylinder R cross lambda inside of this picture here. And the uh, some number of boundary punctures of this sort. Um, and what happens is that the boundary of the disk maps to this Lagrangian cylinder, but the punctures will go off to either plus or minus infinity. Um, and let's see. So I learned from being in the audience that there's not very many colors that look distinct. I'm going to use this anyway, but I am aware that it looks more or less the same. It looks, it's invisible. Ah, that's worse. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm also aware that this picture probably is a little bit, uh, too crowded to be useful, so let me, let me just draw what, the, what I've just drawn there in, in white. Uh, so this looks like, 
something like this. That's what I've drawn there. So this is the, uh, at the top, this goes to the Rabecord AI. And on the bottom, it goes to the Rabecords AJ1 through AJK uh, for this Legendrian lambda at plus or minus infinity. And uh, so the homology coefficients keep track of the homology classes of these boundary bits. So alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha 2, et cetera, through alpha k. So each of those is just some curve on lambda or on the cylinder over lambda, I guess. Um, OK, so that's, that's the moduli space uh, that we consider to get Legendrian contact homology. And there's an R action on this moduli space. So the entire thing is uh, invariant under translation in the vertical direction. Uh, so that's, that's uh, why we consider it. So a rigid holomorphic disk is one where uh, the only thing that you can do to it is just perturb it up and down in this R direction. And I should say, the, so the word associated to this particular disk is just you read, so this, this is the positive end. This is the AI that you're taking the differential of. And then uh, the term that this contributes to the differential is you just read off everything else as you go around the disk. So alpha 0, aj1, alpha 1, aj2, et cetera, through alpha k. Okay. Yes, Nick. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I was sloppy about this, but indeed you have to choose what are called capping paths uh, that join up the endpoints of, of the rabe cords so that these become closed uh, elements of H1, yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Maybe I'll bring this back down. Um, so the theorem, which uh, in this setting uh, was proven by Ekholm, Ednayer, and Sullivan. Uh, but there were uh, proofs in, in uh, more restricted contexts by, for instance, Chekhanov. Um, so the theorem is that, so this, this uh, D, uh, is actually a differential. So if you extend it by the Leibniz rule to the entire algebra, then its square is zero. Um, it has degree, so it lowers degree by one. I didn't tell you about the degree, so maybe that's not as exciting. Uh, and uh, so since d squared is zero, you can take the homology, uh, and this is invariant under uh, Legendrian isotopy of lambda. Uh, and this is what I'll call the Legendrian contact homology of lambda. So, Um, let's send this up to the top. Um, so in the setting that we're interested in, um, so lambda is this Legendrian co-normal torus, lambda k, uh, and v is the cosphere bundle of R3, which is also the one jet space of S2. Uh, and in this case, 
So what all this says is this says that this, this algebraic thing here, the Legendrian contact homology of lambda k, is, a, is an invariant of k itself. So this is a not invariant. Um, uh, a smooth isotopy invariant of k, uh, and this, it's called not contact homology. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on not contact homology, which I don't want to get into, but it's, you know, there's a combinatorial formula for it. Uh, it contains the Alexander polynomial. It detects the unknot. There are other things I won't write down. Um, so in order to prove this results, which I have covered up, so let me see if I can uncover it. Yes. So in order to prove, to prove that result there, uh, it would suffice to know that uh, not contact homology is a complete not invariant, so it's, it completely determines the underlying not k. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know if that's true or not, so it's, it's an open question. Is not contact homology a complete invariant? Um, so uh, this, we still don't know the answer to, but I'm going to approach this then by sort of uh, enhancing this invariant a little bit to something that actually does turn out to be a complete invariant. Um, so So we can enhance this, and this is what I'll talk about next. So the idea to enhance this is to uh, add a cotangent fiber to the picture. So again, we have k sitting inside of R3, and we have this uh, Legendrian torus sitting inside of the, this five-dimensional contact manifold. And now we're going to uh, now choose a point P in R3 minus k. So just a point dis disjoint from the knot. And this point itself also has a conormal uh, bundle. So the conormal bundle of a point is better known as just the fiber of the, over the point in this uh, unit cotangent bundle. So, um, so this is the cotangent fiber. Um, I'm just going to define this to be the cotangent fiber of, of this uh, contact manifold over the point P. So this is just, uh, over the point P, it's just a, an S2. So this is a um, Legendrian sphere uh, disjoint from lambda k. So lambda k here, this is a Legendrian torus. Uh, two torus. And uh, so we, what we've done is we've taken not just the conormal of the knot itself, but also the conormal of a point that's disjoint from this knot. And now instead of just having a Legendrian torus, we now have a torus and a sphere. Um, and the observation uh, is that if a point P is disjoint from two knots, k and k prime, and k is actually isotopic to k prime, uh, 
Now this is where my notation looks sort of bad. So smoothly isotopic to k prime, then, um, oh, sorry, this is not what I meant to say. So if P is disjoint from both of these things and the conormal torus of K is Legendre and isotopic to uh, the conormal torus to K prime, then the same thing is true if you put in this, uh, this conormal, this cotangent fiber. So that is to say that the isotopy between K and K prime can be chosen so that it avoids this, uh, this Legendrian sphere. Um, and this is just because R3 is not compact. So whatever isotopy you have that takes the conormal of K to the conormal of K prime, uh, it, if you project that isotopy to R3, then it, it gives you some sort of compact region and you just pick P outside of that region and then the isotopy never, never touches uh, this cotangent fiber. Okay. Um. So then, if you start with a not k, uh, instead of looking at the Legendrian contact homology of lambda k, we can look at the Legendrian contact homology of lambda k union lambda p. Um, and this is what I'm going to call enhanced not contact homology. Uh, and this is also an invariant of the underlying not k. So this is an invariant. Smooth invariant of k. Um, and the sense in which it's enhanced over what was there before is that uh, the LCH of lambda k by itself is some sort of quotient of this, more or less. Um, and the point is that, uh, so the algebra, so the, the DGA for lambda k union lambda p uh, is generated by rabe chords. Well, let's, let's just drop the homology classes. So it's generated by rabe chords of, of this Legendrian link. So it's generated by uh, of the link. And so you can put some additional structure on it as essentially the structure of a, some sort of quiver algebra, or some, something, not quite, but almost, um, by keeping track of what components the rabe chords begin and end on. Um, so this gives uh, get additional structure by examining, by keeping track of of what components the endpoints of a rape chord lie on. Lie on. Okay. Um, sort of want to keep that. See what we want to say. I'll uh, go back over here. Uh, so within the algebra for the DGA for this, uh, this Legendrian link, uh, I'm going to define, again, this is going to be a little bit imprecise, but uh, hopefully it'll make sense. Uh, a, P, K, P. So this is going to be 
the Z submodule uh, generated by, uh, and I should say, at this point, I'm going to, uh, well, let me finish. Words with two uh, mixed rave chords. So I'm going to disregard the homology coefficients and just write down the rave chords, but the homology coefficients should still be there. It's just annoying to have to write them down. So AI1 is supposed to be a rave chord from lambda p to lambda k. And then all of the ones in the middle go from lambda k to lambda k. And the very last one goes from lambda k to lambda p. So there's an initial, initial chord that goes from p to k, and then you stay on k for a while, and then go from k to p. Okay. So this is not quite a differential subalgebra, but it's close. So this is, you can consider this to be a quotient of the original DGA, and then the, the differential descends to that. So the, um, this differential on the entire DGA uh, descends to a, on a uh, differential on this thing that I've now written. A P goes to K goes to P. <laughs> Essentially, the reason for this is just that the differential of any uh, mixed chord, so if, if uh, AI goes between two different components of this Legendrian link, then something inside of here will also have to be a mixed chord. Um, and so this gives you some sort of filtration, and, and uh, so it's easy to check that this descends, this differential descends to uh, a well-defined operation on here whose square is zero. Um, and furthermore, there's a, I think I want to say this. But I'm just going to scribble it down right here. So there's a product structure that's compatible with this differential on A, P, K, P. Uh, that's given by counting holomorphic disks. So, so far I've had holomorphic disks with just one end at plus infinity. So you have to count them with, uh, consider holomorphic disks with two ends at plus infinity. Uh, so this product structure is due to uh, work of Tobias from, what do I have in my notes, 2006. Um, uh, that's obtained by, by counting uh, holomorphic disks uh, with two positive ends. So this is a little bit more than Legendrian contact homology. It's it's uh, considering holomorphic disks that are pushing into uh, the more general theory, which is called symplectic field theory, Legendrian symplectic field theory. Um, I'm sorry, say again? Oh, a mixed chord is just a rave chord whose endpoints are in different components. Um, so this gives A, P, K, P uh, a ring structure uh, and Again, the, so one can check that the differential satisfies the Leibniz rule with respect to this. And so it, give, it gives the homology of this uh, a ring structure. So a, you can multiply things in there. Um, okay, and I think maybe now it's time to bring back down that top one.
So the, the, uh, the theorem that we use to, to prove this is that uh, this ring uh, in, the, in the lowest degree, which for some reason is degree one, uh, is essentially the group ring of, of the knot group. So, um, This is not quite true, so we, uh, we have to add on a sum and z. Uh, but then these things are isomorphic as rings. Okay. Uh, so, um, yes, that's right. That's essentially that you have to. Well, so what's, what it's going to turn out to be is that this is, this is supposed to uh, be some sort of partially wrapped fluoromology, and this thing is, corresponds to one additional generator you have to put in for a self-intersection of Lagrangians. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the honest answer is that I actually have no good explanation for why you have to put this in. It just turns out to be true. <laughs> um, okay. So, so the proof of this uh, uses some work of, so the proof, uh, uses some work of Tillybach, Ekholm, Lakshev, and myself uh, from a, a bit earlier this year uh, that relates this, uh, well, relates not contact homology to what's called string homology. So. Let me just say to string topology. Ah, yes. Um, so uh, it's just the ring structure of this as a direct sum. So um, the unit, the identity is one comma zero. And you multiply just uh, component-wise. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. What, all I'm doing is I'm adding in a unit. That's right. And that that unit times anything in here is x as the identity. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, and with a little bit more work. Uh, so, so remember that then, then what happens is we just follow uh, Shende's approach. So what this says is that from this enhanced Legendrian contact homology, we can extract the group ring of the knot group. And with a little bit more work, you can, again, identify the longitude and meridian inside of here. And the, the group ring along with the longitude and meridian is enough to determine the, uh, the knot type completely. Um, okay. I'm going to put some question marks on here because this, so we can prove this, but it somehow seems rather ad hoc and a little bit strange. So what, what I want to spend the last uh, 10 minutes uh, doing is trying to advocate for um, an interpretation of this, which we haven't actually completely worked out, but uh, seems promising. Okay. Uh, actually. Maybe I'll erase the question marks. This makes it look like I'm not sure this theorem is true. <laughs> okay. It is an H1, yes. Uh, yes, so multiplication uh, is a degree minus one operation here. I think it's just an, uh, there's some induced automorphism on, on pi k that, and it's, it's just that. Yeah, the, the choice of capping chords is important to get this, uh, capping paths is important to get this, but somehow it's not that interesting in the action.
OK. Um, so here's a possible interpretation for this theorem. And it uses uh, a version of partially wrapped fluoromology. Um, and I should say, as inspiration, maybe the, the inspiration for this sort of approach is that uh, if you look at the wrapped fluor homology, cohomology of a cotangent fiber in a cotangent bundle, uh, this is the cohomology of the free loop space. So this is uh, Abundandolo and Schwartz, and I guess Mohammed has some nice interpretation of this. Um, so here's the picture. So the picture is going to be, so I'll try to draw this a little bit more uh, generally than we'll actually need it. So let's suppose that W is a Liouville domain. There's a symplectic manifold with a contact boundary. Um, and lambda sitting inside of V Legendrian. Ah, so maybe I can actually draw this over here. So without the Legendrian part, this is the setting for, uh, for wrapped fluor homology, where what happens is you take a Legendrian, uh, sorry, a Lagrangian submanifold inside of the Liouville domain, and then uh, perturb it at the, at the end by uh, g following some Hamiltonian uh, vector field. And so we want to do the same thing, except uh, we want the Hamiltonian vector field to somehow avoid this Legendrian uh, lambda. So, um, <coughs> follow the prescription for reps, fluor homology, but choose, so this is very imprecise, uh, choose a Hamiltonian uh, vector field that avoids lambda, so vector field. Uh, I'll, I'll write this out. Voids. Okay, so here's the picture. So the picture is here is V and here is W. And we can extend this to a non compact uh, thing by tacking onto here R plus cross V. This is some sort of non compact. Uh, symplectic manifolds, and so the usual picture, again, is that you take some sort of Lagrangian, and we're going to regret having done that. You take some sort of Lagrangian in here, and then if you have two Lagrangians, then you, you perturb one of them. So you first extend them out to infinity by cylinders, and then one of them you perturb by, by following uh, the flow of a Hamiltonian vector field that uh, allows it to wrap around in, in this direction. Um, so maybe, so now, now what I want is I want to have, oh, that color does not exist. So here is, uh, here is a Legendrian sitting inside of V. And what I want is I want to, to have the vector field so that it is zero along uh, R plus cross lambda. Um, and so it sort of goes, uh, well, the way it's going to go is, is the vector field will point away from the Lagrangian cylinder, and then it'll do something else outside of here. Um, So I should say, I guess Zach is going to talk about partially wrapped fluoromology later on in this uh, 
workshop. But that's so that that setting I think is a little bit different. So there the the uh, partial the the way that the wrapping gets stopped is using a uh, hypersurface, and here it's uh, using a Legendrian uh, submanifold. It is secretly a hyper. It is right. So you can. So yeah, you can take a tubular neighborhood of that Lagrangian and just sort of drill it out. For instance, that's one way to say this. Uh, A random chord from L to L is not going to get anywhere near to lambda. That's right. Um, well, so maybe let, let me draw another picture. Uh, Okay, so what I would say is that, that you, you look at this Lagrangian half cylinder R plus cross lambda in this infinite region and take a tubular neighborhood of it. Uh, and then uh, the, essentially the, the Liouville domain I want to replace W by is W union this piece right here. So the boundary looks like, the contact boundary now looks like this. Uh, and now I'm going to do, I'm going to do honest wrapped fluoromology on, on that thing there. Um, so replace W by W union a neighborhood of R plus cross lambda and do um, I'll call it W hat and do wrapped fluoromology on W hat. Um, so in some sense, you haven't really done so much, except that then the whatever the Hamiltonian vector field is going to avoid uh, what used to be lambda here. Um, so, so the case that I want to consider is, so in, for our case, uh, W is the disk cotangent bundle of R3. Uh, so V is the boundary of this. So this is what I had already set up. And then lambda is lambda K. Um, so V, W, here's lambda K. Um, and the thing that I want to take the wrapped fluoromology of is now going to be a fiber. So that I guess I was calling this uh, LP. Uh, so LP is, I guess I didn't call this anything actually. So LP, so LP is the disk fiber uh, of uh, D T star R3 over P. So this is a Lagrangian disk and its boundary is, is lambda P. Um, and then the claim is that, that uh, then uh, if you look at the partially wrapped complex for, oh, I, I didn't define F. So F for me is fiber, so this is just LP with itself. Um, this turns out to be, so it's, there's a single generator that's for a self-intersection of this Lagrangian with the push-off of itself. And then the, all of the other generators will correspond to these uh, mixed words that I was writing as A, P, K, P. Um, and, right. And the differential actually agrees. So there's a differential over on the, in the wrap side and there's a differential over here and they actually agree with each other. 
and this gives you exactly that uh, the wrapped fluoromology, I guess in degree one, is, yes. And so what this says is that uh, this, this sort of mysterious result that I have there up at the top that says that that strange thing on the left is isomorphic to the group ring of pi k, that's nothing more than saying that this, this wrapped, a partially wrapped fluoromology of this cotangent fiber with itself, uh, uh, with the wrapping stopped by this Lagrangian torus is, uh, oops, this will be the last thing. So the theorem says, that this is isomorphic to Z pi k. And this somehow is a much, much more natural looking result that just says that the, this is the wrapped fluoromology in the, in the lowest possible degree is just given by the group ring of, of uh, the not group. Okay. I think that's all I have, so thanks.